Hello, Pastor Daniel here with you on this Monday of Holy Week, just a day after we celebrated Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This year, inspired by or perhaps necessitated by the pandemic, uh, we've gotten a little creative. And we're going to offer a digital time of prayer, just a brief time together of scripture, um, reflection, and prayer each night of Holy Week. We begin tonight on Monday, and we'll continue with a time of prayer tomorrow night, Tuesday, Wednesday night. On Thursday, we'll have a special service, something very brief, just an introduction to the practice of hand washing or foot washing as we find in the scriptures. And we will provide a liturgy to uh, encourage you to practice this ritual of serving um, at home with your family, with friends, with those who you're able to safely gather with. On Friday of Holy Week, we will benefit from Dan Wagner's hard work putting together a beautiful musical meditation on the seven last words of Jesus. That, of course, will be digital as well. We will resume our prayers on Saturday, Holy Saturday, traditionally the night of an Easter vigil, um, where the church would gather and hold a vigil throughout the night, recognizing the time that Jesus was in the tomb. And then, of course, we gather together on Sunday morning, Easter morning, just a short week from now, not even. This year, we will hold Easter services in person and live streamed on Facebook. Check the church website to register for a spot in one of our rotating services. Uh, done that way so that we can be sure that the air quality is safe and that we don't have too many worshipers in the sanctuary at any one time. This is a unique year for Holy Week. We were in the pandemic this time last year. Um, but uh, as we've learned, every day is different as we seek to adjust to new understandings of how this virus works, what's safe, what's unsafe. But with all of that and working through that as a community, we can still gather for our studies, for our worship, for our time together, our fellowship. And so I look forward for you to join me uh, each night this Holy Week, and we'll begin tonight. Tonight is a reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, a story that's told in all four Gospels, but found in different places and told with slightly different details in each account. It's the story of the woman who washes the feet or head of Jesus with perfume. Now, throughout Lent, I've been facilitating a study with members of Grace Church on the events of Holy Week, and this was one of the verses addressed. I highly recommend you pick up a copy of the book by Amy Jill Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, -E, and the book is called Entering the Passion of Jesus, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Week. She has a beautiful chapter on this very story, and I think you'll find her description and her analysis very compelling. And then she goes on to ask very important questions about how this story shapes our lives as disciples and orders our sense of giving, of serving, and receiving. But let's listen to what John has to say. Again, the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, the first 11 verses. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii, and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, 
he kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said to him, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A powerful story, one I've often told, asking us to close our eyes and imagine being in that room. It's a very sensory, rich experience. Imagine the lighting coming from the dinner table lamp, the rest of the room quite dark. Imagine Mary cracking that jar of perfume and the smell just emanating and dispersing throughout the room. And yet she says nothing. It's a great act of devotion, recognition of not only who Jesus is, but what he's about to go through. Jesus says, she has anointed me, she has saved this perfume for my burial. The disciples, even Peter, continually deny that this is going to happen. And yet here comes Mary as if it's a given fact for her, using her most costly perfume to anoint Jesus for burial. So there's so much in this passage that we can explore in terms of how we serve, not always with our words, but with everything we have. We remember the story of the widow's mite told just before this, about the widow who gives two copper coins, not very much at all, but it's all she has. Her entire faith goes into her dedication to the temple, to the God of Jesus. I'd be remiss, though, if we didn't address that one puzzling sentence that Jesus utters, you will always have the poor with you. It's one of the most problematic, because it puts Jesus in a pretty bad light at first read. Seems pretty dismissive of the plight of the poor, the plight of the very people that he has spent so much time ministering to. Something seems odd. Well, again, I'll encourage you to read Amy Jill Levine's book. But in short, as she addresses that sentence, she reminds us that that very phrase, you will always have the poor with you, comes from the book of Deuteronomy. As is so often the case, Jesus is pulling upon his knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, often the Psalms, but in this case, Deuteronomy. And the sentiment behind it is not so much dismissive of the poor, but rather saying that you should always be serving the poor at all other times, because that is your obligation. And the poor are always there. There's always someone who needs our help. But in this case, it's worth the time and the dedication to pay attention to who Jesus is and how his presence transforms our lives. It's a shift in how we understand that phrase, but it helps keep it in perspective. Now with that passage, that beautiful act of devotion from Mary, dinner at the table with Lazarus, newly raised from the dead, let us pray. Lord God, six days before his death, your son sat with Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and ate dinner with his friends. Once again, your gospel tells us Martha served, and Mary knelt at the feet of Jesus to anoint them with costly perfume. The disciple who was about to betray him said that it was a waste. He didn't care about the poor, really. He just wanted to fill his own pockets, we know and to make Mary feel ashamed. Lord God, often we cannot discern what is best, when to pour out our costly perfume for your sake, even if the world thinks it's a waste, when to be busy serving, or when to rest at your son's feet and learn. So God, give us ears to hear you and eyes to see. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I hope you'll join me tomorrow evening for another brief time of scripture and prayer. See you then. <laughs>